discussion uh, about the West Memphis Three, with Damien Eccles, who was one of the young men convicted and later released in the murder of three young boys. He spent close to half his life on death row. He also spoke with Damien's wife, Lori Davis. They married in jail. And film director Amy Berg. I asked Amy Berg about the new evidence she and her crew have discovered. Amy Berg, the new information that came out about the way these three little boys were killed, um, it had always been painted as some kind of satanic ritual where they were carved up, in particular their genitals cut. Talk about what was found out. Well, when we, okay, the, Fran and Peter brought, one of the first things they did when they came on was they paid for all of these amazing forensics experts to take a look at the autopsies and the photos and the reports. And suddenly there was this theme that, that these, all these wounds were actually post-mortem. They did not happen before death as the state painted this satanic theory. So you, you almost have to take the whole case and throw it out at that point, because there, were, there was just nothing to substantiate the claims. Um, so what we did is we discovered that there were, Lori and I actually went to West Memphis and we talked to people about the snapping turtles that existed in the body. Snapping bodies. turtles. Huge snapping turtles. We're talking about like 110 pound beasts. They're like prehistoric beasts. And they we talked to, to, to turtle experts, breeders, and apparently snapping turtles go to corpses. Whenever there's a, a corpse, then they will... Because they were found yes. in a ditch in a yes. creek. They were found in the ditch. So we actually did an experiment, which is in our film, um, where we the, the closest thing to human flesh is a pig's carcass. So we actually got a pig and had a humane society had to um, kill the pig and we did an experiment with the pig and the turtles and it's an, an amazing scene in the film I think um, but it shows that the wounds I mean they're identical the, these were all scratch marks they were claw marks and the boys did not die from the wounds the boys died from blunt force trauma to the head and they drowned in the water so it changes the whole scope of the <coughs> case you know Damien you're inside behind bars as this is all unfolding. What did you think when you heard this? Hmm. I, I tried really to stay out of the case as much as I possibly could while I was in prison because I was just literally trying to survive from day to day. You know, when it came to the case and all the details and all the investigation and everything else that was going on, literally Lori handled every single part of it because if I had to sit in that cell and think about this case all the time, it would have turned me into an extremely angry and bitter person. So while Lori was handling all that, um, I was in there just trying to keep my sanity. Now you were in the hole for how long, in solitary confinement? Well, they moved me to a super maximum security prison um, somewhere between eight and 10 years before I got out. So I was in there for a very, very long time. I didn't have any fresh air, any sunlight. My health was rapidly declining. I was losing my eyesight. Um, it, it was getting really, really bad. You know, there were times when I didn't think I was going to live to ever see outside those prison walls, not because I was going to be executed, but because my health was just deteriorating so rapidly that I didn't think I was going to make it. How did you, often did you get to talk to anyone? I got to see Lori once a week. Um, we talked on the phone every day. Other than that, I had almost no contact with people at all, other than, you know, prison guards, things like that. How did you keep your sanity? A lot of it was, you, you have to establish some sort of routine for yourself. You know, I did anywhere from five to seven hours of meditation a day. I did an extreme amount of reading, studying. Um, I focused a lot on artwork, you know, different forms of art, whether it was painting or collage or writing, whatever it was. You know, I had to find things to keep myself involved in. Um, did you have any communication with the other young men who were convicted with you of these three the boys? The state did everything they could to prevent any sort of communication at all. Most of the time we were even at completely separate prisons. All three boys found in the ditch uh, were tied, their hands and legs were yeah, tied to each tied. other. They were hogtied by shoelaces. Mm -hmm. And you found uh, uh, the 
in the investigation mm -hmm. hair mm -hmm. of Terry Hobbs, mm -hmm. the stepfather. Right. Of Stevie. Of Stevie. Stevie. Yeah. Yeah. Stevie. Damien, you're starting to hear about this. You hear about um, Terry Hobbs. What were you thinking about the children and their parents through this period, and then hearing about the question of one of the stepfathers? I mean, it's not as if another stepfather hadn't been raised before and questioned uh, John Mark Byers. Um, in Paradise Lost, uh, there was a serious question about him. Were you concerned that just as the three of you had been sent to jail with these manufactured stories that perhaps these men were also having manufactured stories? I guess there may have been some element of that, you know, just because of what I had been through and knowing how traumatic that was and not wanting to do the same thing to anybody else. But the difference in this case was there was actual physical forensic evidence pointing to this person, which there never was to me. And then we started finding out other things, like the fact that the police had never even interrogated this guy up to that point. You know, he had been completely invisible behind the scenes. Um, that there were witnesses that had seen this guy with the children like an hour before they were murdered. And when I started hearing all that, it was just being completely and absolutely dumbfounded. You know, you, you can't even believe what you're hearing. Amy Berg, you have released new evidence. Um, explain who you have given it to and what you expect to happen now. Um, okay, so we, uh, just as we were finishing our post-production, um, we were told about a call that came in on the tip line. Uh, Terry Hobbs has a brother named Michael Hobbs that lives in Mountain Home, Arkansas. And he, his son has apparently been speaking to numerous numerous they're they're young men now over the years his friends about how his his uncle killed three boys and suddenly there suddenly the guys get out of prison there's this report on 48 hours where they're encouraging people to call the tip line and this call comes in on the tip line and here are three witnesses that say that they know about Terry Hobbs murdering the three kids unbelievable i want to go to august of 2011 to a plea that you made called the Alfred plea that most people in this country had never heard of. Explain what it is that you agreed to, Damien Eccles. There was, I mean, there are a lot of intricate details to it, but what it basically comes down to is you have to accept the deal the state is offering you. You basically plead guilty to this deal, but at the same time, you get to maintain your innocence. And a lot of it was for the state to save face. You know, we had to even sign agreements. Their first question was, would we sign agreements saying we wouldn't sue the state of Arkansas? That's, that was their main question that they wanted answered before they would let us out. So we had to sign that before we could even walk out of the prison. You were held for more than 18 years on death row. Yes. Most of that time. Yes. And you were agreeing not to sue the state, though you were maintaining your innocence. Well, what it all came down to for me was we knew we would win this eventually. We would be exonerated eventually. The state knew that. But they presented this deal to us, basically saying, you can sign this paperwork and you can walk out of prison this week. You can go home before this week is out. Or you can refuse this deal, and yeah, you'll eventually win, but we'll drag this out for another five, ten years, however long it takes. You know, Scott Ellington also says in the movie, the prosecutor, that one of the considerations they had in, in offering, in agreeing to this deal, was that the three of us together could have effectively sued the state for $60 million. So you take that in consideration with the fact that I also knew how corrupt and how desperate they were, and I knew they could have had me stabbed to death in that prison any day of the week for $50. So I knew I would never live to see that exoneration. Laurie, you were married at this time to Damien. When did you both get married? Um, in 1999. So you'd been married for over a decade. Mm -hmm. What were your thoughts when this was presented? I mean, I, had, I, mean, I was preparing for a, a hearing in December, so it was kind of one of the darkest. I mean, even though every all of this was going on, and it was there were some tremendous, there was we were making tremendous strides towards you know this hearing. It was really one of the darkest times for Damien and me because they kept pushing the hearing off. 
And um, so the minute when I got the call from Steve Braga, it was on a Saturday morning. Steve I, Braga, your lawyer. I, yeah, Damien's lawyer. I, I mean, I was thrilled, but it wasn't very long after that call came in that I just went into shock. And so I remained there for about the next <laughs> probably three months. But that week or nine days before he was released was all about this surreal time that both of us were living through and all of us were living through because we couldn't tell anybody, couldn't tell a soul. So we're living in this little insular world. When you stepped, out, stepped outside the courtroom, Damien, what were your thoughts when you were free? I don't think I was thinking at that point. You know, it was such a shock that, um, you know, most people will never, ever have anything in their frame of reference to compare an experience like that to. So there's almost no way that I could ever articulate it to the average person. The, you know, there aren't words even big enough for something like that. And your thoughts on the prison system that you have spent half of your life in? Once again, there's almost no words just because of how horrendous it is. You know, people think they have an idea of what the prison system is like, but they don't. They have no idea. Lori, the books you sent Damien in jail? Yeah, well, so many of them. We have them all in storage right now in Arkansas. I'm trying to figure out what to do with them. Thousands of books. And then he received books from people from around the world, too. So, um, but we read the same books, and he eventually got tired of reading my books and ventured on it. But that was a good, you know, we had to find ways to connect um, because we didn't have, you know, the, the physical contact. So books were a big part of that. Peter and Fran would try to keep me at least moderately educated about what was going on in the world. So they would send me, you know, like tons of magazine subscriptions, um, books, things like that, just to try to keep, if I couldn't, you know, for example, see movies that were coming out, at least I would be able to read about them or whatever it was in pop culture that was going on. And probably 95 to 98 percent of the magazines that they would send me were barred from the prison. You know, everything from Rolling Stone, GQ, Esquire, all these different magazines because the prison said they promote homosexuality. <laughs> Therefore, they were all barred from the prison. What were you allowed to read? What subscriptions got through? TV Guide <laughs> and Entertainment Weekly. And how does the how does the censorship work at the prison? Remember we talked about the roof that oh right. It's <laughs> It was a committee comprised of the warden, the prison chaplain, and a couple of the guards that they had veto power over anything coming into the prison. And that's the two things that they said about everything. Either it promotes homosexuality or it... Um, it was satanic. It, it's satanic, yeah. People would send me things, you know, for example, somebody sent me a book. Um, I can't even remember what it was about, but I just remember it had Hebrew writing in it. They said that's satanic. That's witchcraft. I can't receive a book that has Hebrew in it. What has surprised you most about being free? And do you feel free? I do. I, I do feel free, but there are still a lot of things that are really overwhelming to me and things that I'm just having to slowly learn, you know, a, a lot of things about technology. You know, whenever I went in, there was no such thing as the internet as far as I knew. I had never seen it. The last time I had seen a computer was 1986, and it was basically a giant glorified typewriter for really rich people. You know, that, that's basically all it was good for. Um, there were cell phones, but once again, there were things that only really wealthy people had, and they were these giant contraptions that you didn't see out on the street anywhere. That was mostly something you saw in movies. So, you know, it, it really is stepping into a complete new world for me. And <clears throat> meeting members of the families of the three eight-year-old boys who were killed, talk about who you've gotten to meet and your thoughts. I've met um, John Mark Byers and his wife. I've met Pam Hobbs and her sister. And we've all actually sat together a couple nights ago and had dinner for the first time. And it was actually a pretty enjoyable experience. You know, it was just, uh, 
it's almost, I guess, like people who've been through a war together, and, and you sort of have this experience that you can all relate to. Are Michael Moore's parents speaking? No, I haven't spoken to them at all. They've, and the way I've always looked at it is, I didn't initially approach either um, the Byers family or the Hobbs family. It was after they came to me because um, I think it's kind of disrespectful to you know, sort of pry into their lives unless they want you to. And Pam Hobbs' thoughts today? Pam, the uh, the ex-wife of Terry Hobbs, who's now, well, according to well, the film, West of Memphis, and we'll see if, according to the prosecution, the prime suspect at this point. Pam Hobbs is extremely supportive now, and she's um, pretty vocal about her support, too, and we're very thankful for her. To people who are behind bars in this country who are listening to this broadcast right now, what would you like to share with them, Damien Eccles, after 18 years in prison, 17 of those years on death row? Just not to give up. You know, there was a line in the movie, I can't, well, I think it was Fran that said it, it was in one of her emails. She was talking about how you have to just keep hammering away because eventually, if you do it long enough and hard enough, you can break anything and even when it doesn't seem like it even when it doesn't seem like you're making any progress at all you just have to keep hammering away Damien and Laurie what are your life plans now you know Damien has pro uh, he's got a book coming out in September and um, some projects uh, art projects coming up I'd love to get back into I used to be a landscape architect so I'd love to actually get back into something creative in my life. It'd be nice. But, you know, we're just up for anything. It's really just a nice time to just sort of be together. Yeah. So it's great. Can the Alfred plea be vacated? Is it possible that it is not the final word? That's our hope. I mean, that's why we're sitting here right now. That's the whole purpose of, of this film is for does us. Does it matter to you? You're free? Yes, it, it does, because this is only... It's not a complete sense of closure, it's only a half sense of closure. You know, this isn't a victory lap for us. We won't have a complete sense of closure until we've been completely and absolutely exonerated, the right people are in jail, and the corruption has been exposed. Um, and since Damien, Jason, and Jesse took the Alfred plea, they were left without any compensation after 18 years in prison. So we've set up a fund to help them, and, and a website to go to is freewestmemphis3.org work and you can if, 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 if people want to help with the fund that's great and also if they want to learn more about the case and what they can do to help exonerate these three men it would be great so thank you and your book comes out in September it's going to be published by Penguin and it's it's there's a lot about the case there are a lot of journals that I kept while I was in prison that was one of the ways that I would maintain my sanity is by journaling almost constantly so there are a lot of those journals there's a lot of straightforward narrative that's just my life story you know, from as far back as I can remember up until now Damien Eccles, Lori Davis, Amy Berg, thanks so much for being with us. Um, as you heard, Damien Eccles has a book coming out, and Amy Berg's film is called West of Memphis, which is also Damien and Lori's film, as they're the producers as well. Thank you so much. And that does it for the show. If you'd like a copy, you can go to our website at democracynow.com.